All right, so tomorrow you guys are gonna be watching The Secret World of Plants. Um, if you haven't started it yet, it's actually a pretty cool watch. I know Frankie finds it not Boring. cool. <laughs> but it actually introduces you to things other than like, oh, it's a tree and oh, it's grass, okay? So when we look at our different hierarchy, remember with taxonomy, we had domain eukarya, then we had kingdom plantae. So the plants, even within the plant, there's a lot of different diversity. There's a lot of different applications for us in terms of us getting food, us receiving oxygen, which is, you know, kind of important. And then also medically, how they get a lot of our different medicines come from plants. So a lot of that um, Native American medicine that transpired prior to modern medicine, a lot of those findings are actually applied to today. So a lot of that medicine, you can see some cool things. So for Bonnie, Bonnie is the study of plants. Do you guys remember what the difference is between us and plants? Oh no. Some can be asexual reproduction. Some? Some. Not all. We're humans and they're plants. Yeah, but you say we're humans, but we're technically just animals. So we're just animals. Yeah, so it's the difference, main thing between plants and animals. So obviously, the taxonomic groups were in two separate kingdoms, right? So there's a reason why we're in these two separate kingdoms. Nothing new with having to do the names. We know it's still that binomial nomenclature. It's still in terms of Latin. So that's not new. The part, though, that I want you to know is what's different between us. Plants have roots. Okay, plants have roots. So does that mean they're not motile? They can't move. No. Wait. Yeah. They can't move. Yeah, plants can't just, like, pick up their roots and start walking away. Okay. They can only spread because of the seed. Okay, some do produce seeds. Okay, what do we know about their cells that are different from our cells? They have a cell wall. They have a cell wall. Of mitochondria. Okay, <laughs> where do they generate energy? Through what process? Uh, uh, photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, oh. right? Can some be heterotrophic and eat other organisms? Yes, so think of like Venus flytrap and stuff like that. Um, that you'll actually see within that video of the secret world of plants, which is kind of cool. Uh, so just quick reminders, a few things, obviously, number one, yes, they do. If we look at the cellular level, they have the cell wall. We do not. A lot of the organelles are exactly the same as ours, but they do have those chloroplasts, and the chloroplasts, remember, are double membrane. Same deal with mitochondria, it has two membranes around it, okay? And that's gonna be important here in a second. Plants also have that large central vacuole, and that kind of helps with that turgor pressure, if you remember back in biology, why plants sometimes go limp, and then if you give them water, now all of a sudden they're not completely folded over. A really good plant, if you like plants, but you feel like you kill them all the time, are lilies. Lilies are so resistant. You can like not water them forever. They can be laying on the ground dead. Give it water and it's like, oh, it's really? a beautiful lily. Yeah, it is. That's why the only live plant I have in my house is a cactus. Yeah, succulents are also really good because they store water a lot better than others. So when you're looking at these cells under a microscope, they're also going to appear green because of the chlorophylls. Okay? So the chlorophylls are going to be activated with the presence of sunlight. So as the sunlight actually hits the leaves, we're going to start energizing those electrons and so those are going to go through the process of photosynthesis if you decide to take ap biology if you're interested in this um, they actually go through step by step what happens to the electron in each of the different thylakoids and each of the granum um, within that chloroplast we won't focus on that i just want you to know for them to generate energy what process do they go through there's a p Photosynthesis, good. Oh, oh, I like, yeah. All right, <laughs> yep. All right, so anybody know what endosymbiont theory means? It's the bigger ones eat the little ones. Yes, so what organelles have oh, two okay. membranes and kind of support this theory? I'm like Einstein. What two organelles have a double membrane? Because it would have the membrane of the original organism and then it would have a new membrane okay, of our larger theory. organism. Yeah. Like similar ones? So I have a double membrane. Who has a double membrane? Plants. 
What organelle? Oh. Yeah. And? Okay. So the endosymbiont theory is the theory of how we went from a single celled organism to multicellular organisms. So with the single celled organisms, obviously they are responsible for producing and generating all their own energy. Well, eventually, big fish eats smaller fish, realizes, hey, smaller fish is producing all this energy. Why don't I just like not kill the small fish and keep it, right? So endo means within, symbiont means it's a symbiosis relationship. It is actually a beneficiary or a mutualistic relationship because number one, small fish isn't gonna get eaten anymore. It now has a house, it has an environment. And then the larger fish now is receiving some of those byproducts. So if you look, the chloroplasts and the mitochondria both generate energy. So the reason as to why they believe this is how we went from unicellular to multicellular is because number one, those two membranes, it is double membraned. The proteins on the outer membrane, which I have here in green, is different from the proteins that are within the pink one or the red one that you see on the screen. Not only that, we know mitochondrial DNA is different than cellular DNA, okay? So when we compare that, we say, okay, well, how did we go from unicellular to multicellular? How is it possible for us to have plants and for us as animals to exist? They believe it's because of this endosymbiont theory, okay? Obviously, you see it's still just a theory. This one's not gonna transition to a law because there's no possible way for us to prove this unless if we can cause this to happen in the lab. So endosymbiont theory also gave rise to our mother organisms, okay? So if our chloroplast, if it was originally a small unicellular organism, it was probably similar to a bacteria. So hypothetically, if you go all the way back to our original common ancestor of all life, we know that it was unicellular and we know that a, T, C, and G, our nucleotide bases, are all the same. Because all living organisms, where you look at archaea bacteria, regular bacteria, or plants, animals, fungus, etc., they also have the basic genetic information. So we know there are some commonalities. It's just about figuring out, okay, well, what was the original one? So if we assume Unicellular, then eventually as time progresses, you get more and more complex, and then you would get multicellular. So if they ate this little tiny bacteria that now is doing photosynthesis, do you guys remember what some of the reactants and products are? No. None? I don't. Well, what do they produce that's really good for us? Oxygen. Okay. And then CO2 because you breathe it out. Okay. Anything else that's all they need? Okay, they need water. Would that be a reactant or a product? Reactant. Okay. What else do they need? Sunlight. Sunlight. <laughs> it's a beautiful sun. Uh, now you have to produce something else that's usable for us. Yeah. Oh. What could be the possible products? What makes kids crazy? Sugar. All right, so we also have glucose being a product. Let's see how you guys did. So we have light energy plus our carbon dioxide plus water produces glucose and oxygen gas. If you look closely at this, hopefully you guys remember, think back to biology. What is cellular respiration? That's how we generate energy, right? We need oxygen, and we eat sugar, and, we and it produces energy. Carbon dioxide as a byproduct, and then also water will be in the product. So when we look at cellular respiration, it's going to be the complete opposite of this, which makes sense because then we know that for a plant, if they need sunlight, water, or carbon dioxide, and they need perfect temperature, well, we need them as well. So if we look at cellular respiration, it's the complete opposite, that complete reversal of photosynthesis. 
So that means together, in order for us to survive, we need plants, which means if we need plants, then plants also need us, okay? Do you guys know where most life was originally here on Earth? Think all the way back to when it, initially it was hot, molten lava. Was there much life there? No, it began to cool, and then we had the formation of water, and most life was in the water, right? So how is it possible that us, we are living outside of the water? We evolved because of who, though? Who made it possible? Other Science organisms. would disagree with you, but other organisms, more specifically plants. So we had to see that transition of plants to the land first, because what are they going to continue to release? Oxygen and oxygen, oxygen. So then we had enough oxygen built up in the environment, in our atmosphere, that we were then able to transition, to transition from water to land. And when I say us, we're talking about just animals in general, not us as common humans that we think of it. Okay, so life transition from water to land. Now there still are a lot of organisms that live in the water and they actually get their oxygen from dissolved oxygen in the water. So you have H2O, but then you also have all those gases and stuff like that in it. And so they actually use that as it goes across their gills in order to gain oxygen. All right, so we are going to be transitioning on to plants. And when we look at plants, remember we said that there are still taxonomic groups and we are still going to classify things based upon similarities between organisms. So when we look at plants, one thing that you can use is what's called a dichotomous key. It basically gives you an either or statement. So does it have five petals or does it have seven petals? And then once you decide on that, it'll tell you where to go next. So if it has five petals, we're going to go down. Is the petal a single piece or is it deeply divided? Oh, I remember those. Yeah, so this is just a quick, easy way that we can try to classify things. But the only thing is, is we can't really do it for all of plants because then that would be a gigantic dichotomous key. But here's another example. This is one if you're trying to identify different plants, different trees and stuff like that. Do we have pines? Do we have spruces? Do we have oaks? Do we have elms? Etc. So just a couple of different characteristics about each of them. So some are going to have needles, some are going to have leaves, some are going to be compound leaves, some are going to be simple. Some will have edges that are smooth and others will be rough. Some will have leaflets and others will not. So when we look at a simple leaf, a simple leaf is just one singular blade. So even though, do you guys see how on this one it's kind of lobed? Yeah, but it's okay. still just one. It's still just one leaf. <laughs> Okay, because it doesn't actually come down to our vein right here. So that's our main vein. And then we have secondary veins that branch out. And do you see how each of these run into each other? That was one of the things you were trying to identify in the scavenger hunt. Yeah. They have veins that run into each other, so that would be branched. Whereas ones that don't run into each other would be, and guesses, parallel. parallel. Okay, a compound leaf. I like to think of it as it's just a little bit more complex. So with on that main vein, you're actually gonna see multiple leaflets. So small little ones that are extending off. And then you'll also have a secondary vein coming through that. So you can have leaflets and it has both those primary and secondary veins. You can have a double compound leaf. So it would be on the secondary vein that it actually branches out. So then we would have another tertiary level of veins. So we have both simple and compound. If it's simple, again, it's just one leaf. Whereas if it's compound, you're going to have multiple leaflets. And maybe that attaches along a main vein or it attaches at one singular point like this for our palmate. So today, you guys are going to be trying to identify. I went outside for you guys and got a bunch of different leaves, and I want you guys to try to classify them. Bless you. So if it's a palmate, think about it as if this is your hand. Your fingers represent all the little leaflets, and it connects at one singular point. So right here is where it's connecting at one singular point. Anybody know what kind of leaf this is? Wait, so the blade? Ding, 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 it's a buckeye. Is it actually? Yeah, 
that's actually a book I leave. Oh, <laughs> oh man, guys, come on. So yes, this is a buckeye leaf. So each of the individual leaflets attached at that one single point. And so from there, you're gonna increase your surface area. The ultimate goal is to have more leaves because if I have more leaves, that's a greater area for sunlight to hit and then for that energy to be converted into usable sugars for the plant, okay? And then it would store those sugars. A pinnate, we still have multiple leaflets, but if you look, they attach at multiple points along the petiole. The petiole is just the fancy term for that main vein through the middle, okay? One thing that can be a little difficult and a little bit more challenging is if you have a petiole that has started to become a woody tissue, okay? So if you look at herbaceous, which means it's all green, versus woody tissue, so something like a tree that has bark. You can find an in-between. Do you know what the in-between would be? No. A shrub or a bush would be a good example of something that's in-between. So you might see here, this petiole might actually be woody tissue, but you will see all the leaflets connected along it in an organized fashion. So you're gonna see examples and we're gonna go through the ones in the back so you guys will actually get to see those. So take a look at this one. Would this be simple or compound? Um, compound. compound. Pinnate or palmate? Palmate, remember, connects at one point. Pinnate along pinnate. it. Pinnate. pinnate, good. What about this one? Compound. And palmate because it connects at one point. What about this one? Simple. Can I say if it's pinnate or palmate? No. Nope, that's only for compound. How about this one? Compound. Compound. Pinnate or palmate? Palmate. Good. All right, how about this one? Simple. Skip. All right, now look at the veination. Do you see how this kind of looks like a feather? It's parallel. It's parallel. They don't run into each other. Branch looks like a tree. Correct. So here would be branched. Right, so you can see the veins actually run into each other. They're not separate, okay? You see uh, branching at multiple points. Did you mean to circle branch or circle? Ah, poop, not that one. Ha, branched, it's branched. <laughs> They're gonna love watching this video. They're gonna be like, wow, she's crazy. All right, how about this one? Hi. Branched. Frankie said hi, guys. All right, how about this one? Parallel. parallel. The main thing with why it's parallel or branched is actually gonna relate to whether it's a monocot or dicot, and that's gonna be kind of where we're heading into next week. So if it's monocot or dicot, the vascular bundles, which are gonna be our xylem and our phloem, that's what transports water and sap, or the sugars in a plant, are gonna be arranged in different methods or different ways. Those are just another opportunity for us to further classify organisms as either as a monocot, dicot, whether they're branched or parallel, whether they're pinnate, point, simple, or compound. Okay, so that's just another way for us to actually do that. All right, so now you guys are going to need the leaf venation activity. And in the back, I have a bunch of leaves laid out for you. I do have magnifying glasses that I'll pull out. Try not to touch the leaves, okay? Still sanitize before you go to the back. You'll use the magnifying glass to try to help you identify, is it simple or is it compound? If you say it's simple, do not say if it is pinnate or palmate. Remember, that does not count. Only if it's compound does that count. 